The Leave Your Legacy podcast is supported by Wise Financial. Wise Financial is a Northwestern Mutual private client group member. For over 20 years, Wise Financial has dedicated its efforts to designing comprehensive wealth management strategies for business owners and many accomplished athletes. Through their efforts, Wise Financial has been recognized as an industry leading firm. The Northwestern Mutual Life Insurance Company, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Hello and welcome to a special episode of the Leave Your Legacy podcast. I'm your host, Kenya Murray, and we say special for a couple reasons. We're actually on location in Dallas. Uh, we're down here for the Sacramento Kings, Dallas Mavericks game. Obviously here to watch Keegan play tonight, coming off of a seven three-point game against uh, New Orleans and uh, continues to, to shatter that record. But it's also special because of my guest today, Coach Rich Walker, who Rich and I go way back. We go way back. I mean, uh, we've, oh my, 15 years old, I think I was yeah. when we first got yeah. together. Yeah. yeah. Um, what happened was Gary Close talked about this kid in Battle Creek. I said, Battle Creek? Mm -hmm. I lived, my wife, when Jen and I got married, we moved to Kalamazoo, which is a city next to Battle Creek. So he said, yeah, and this guy named Turner is, mm -hmm. Coach Turner is coaching him. I said, Chuck Turner? <laughs> and that's really how it happened. Because yeah. I, knew, I knew Coach, you know, I knew Coach Turner when he was uh, in Ypsilanti. Yeah. Um, and we were a rivalry uh, in Michigan. Yeah. And, I, and, you know, our most people know us from our relationship at Iowa. They think that's, obviously, that's the connection. But we both grew up in Michigan. Battle Creek, like you said, for me. And you grew up in Inkster. So how was... How was life for Rich Walker growing up in Inkster, Michigan? It was, it, it, there were a lot of, um, a lot of things that taught me a lot. Um, growing up in Detroit during that time, and, um, it was, it was uh, different. Um, Black is beautiful was kind of a mantra. So, you know, people of color thought they uh, were the best in the world and mm -hmm. were uplifting themselves. Motown was at its its peak. Um, so the music industry was booming. The car industry was booming. Um, for young people, I think uh, you had to do something. In other words, you had to get a trade. You had to play sports. You had to sing. You had to do something. Mm -hmm. um, and everybody wanted to get out um, and, and be somebody, so right. to speak. So. Right. Uh, for me, my parents were musicians, and um, after she hit me on my hand with that paddle <laughs> several times, I decided I didn't want to play the piano. Right. <laughs> so I ran from everything, and she was a music teacher. And uh, no, she was real. She was a very good teacher, and um, she was, but she was hard on on me. Yeah. And it it as a child, I I, I didn't deal with it properly. But anyway. I ended up playing baseball and then basketball because I got tall all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. So uh, growing up there, it was it was a lot of fun because the music was great every weekend. Mm -hmm. I mean, off the chain. And yeah. you could go for $2 and see virtually everybody in Motown. That's wild. That's wild. I mean, that, two crazy. bucks, you could sit there all day. You know, I hear that story. Going back to some of the stories my mom and dad told me about the things you could do and how much it costs. It's just wow for us to, exactly. <laughs> to think about where we're at right now. Exactly. But you said get out. And so you were a good basketball player. You end up playing at Bowling Green University from 68 to 71. And back then, freshmen were ineligible, correct? So you had Well, I was actually 67. 67, okay. Uh, but I played 68 through – because freshmen were ineligible back then. Yeah. Um, I was lucky enough – to be recruited by Bill Fitch, who just passed, but also just went in the Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. um, and um, he was a college coach starting out, and um, he and uh, Jim Lessick, his assistant, came to my home, recruited me. Uh, my mom pretty much uh, took to him, basically fell in love. Le Lessick was the smooth talker. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Fitch was. So he was you. Yeah, well, <laughs> Fitch was crazy. <laughs> Fitch was nuts. Yeah. But he recruited Bob Hill, uh, who was an NBA coach, yeah. who actually lives here in, in Dallas, and we hang out a lot. And Jim Conley from uh, Spencer Haywood's Pershing team. Okay. It's one of the all-time great high school teams. Yeah. And um, Eric Himes from uh, Cass Tech, 6'6 six, six, uh, forward. So there were four of us that he recruited. And – my mother was um, my mother's best friend was Corky Taylor's. Um, Corky Taylor played for Minnesota. Okay, was Corky Taylor's best friend, mother's best friend. Yeah. So um, 
Fitch saw the value of of uh, recruiting me, um, but also getting getting close with my mom and her her uh, network. But anyway, network of teachers mm-hmm. and the coach, the other assistant had worked there. This is sounding very familiar. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking about how you're bringing back all these memories of how yep. you recruited me. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was uh, one of the one of the really interesting things about recruiting you is. I always flew into Kalamazoo, drove over to yeah. to um, Battle Creek, and then I didn't tell anybody I was there. Yeah, uh, because Michigan is notorious for in that area of getting people, and they they obviously recruited you hard, and um, you know it, it's a tough sell to go to Iowa versus Michigan. But I I. I used to just come in town and then I would go to the stores where you, <laughs> I pretty much l- learned your whole r- uh, route to school yes, and did. back and forth. So I went to the stores where you went and I talked to everybody there. I talked to the janitor. I talked to the counselor. I talked, oh, I talked to two janitors yeah. and I talked to the counselor. And then there was a, a mechanic in that, in that, when I stopped, they told me I should learn him. That yeah. guy who at, that that your dad used to. Yeah. Oh gosh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I know what you're talking about. It's escaping me right now. Right. <laughs> so, so I went and talked with him. So that's what I did when I came to Michigan. And my theory was, if I talked to everybody that you talk to on a daily basis, it would be so impressive and would shock you into wow, they really do want me. Yeah. Kind of thing. So. That was my strategy because Michigan, well, the good news was they had recruited all these really good players. They called themselves the Fab Five. Yeah. So <laughs> they had recruited all these players, and I was like, hey, Kenyon, I'm going to say this, and this is all I'm going to say to you. Where are you going to play? Yeah. Yeah. I know. It, it, it's true. I mean, this is, this is so crazy because I remember, I remember saying, Mom, Coaches recruiting everybody in town, and so it was kind of like if I didn't go to Iowa, <laughs> they burned they burned out our house or they something. Were, they, well, were <laughs> they were they were like, you know what? None of, nobody from Michigan came to talk to me, and yeah. nobody from Michigan State came to talk to me, and and they were depending on one of the assistant coaches had gone to Michigan yeah. at, at 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 Central, and um, uh, there were there were just so many things against us at Iowa. But I wanted to make sure you knew that Iowa was a lifelong commitment. Yeah. And the people in Iowa would always be Kenyon Murray uh, or pro Kenyon Murray because I think once you become a Hawkeye, as you well know, yeah. you're a Hawk for life. Yeah, no, it's, it yeah, brings back great, great memories. And, yeah, I mean, it's coming to fruition for sure. And, you know, taking nothing away from, from your career, though, you were all conference player. I mean, I, and I remember, I know I sent you some questions and I asked, was there a memorable game? I know, I, I think I might know one game that was memorable for you because I think you dropped 26 on them. Uh, but were there any any memorable players that you played against at your time at Bowling Green that just really stand out to yeah. you and stick with you? He, and, and a lot of people don't know this story, but Nick Maletti was a Bowling Green alum, and he was uh, he he had businesses in Cleveland and Canton at that time. Anyway, he he arranged for a game between Niagara and Bowling Green at Cleveland Arena, mm. and at the time they had Calvin Murphy. And I'm oh, not wow. sure you know who it is or your viewers do, but Calvin led the nation in scoring. But more importantly, he was five foot seven. Yeah, this guy was unbelievable, and. Um, Unfortunately, I had to guard him, <laughs> and he he gave he gave me thirty two that day. Uh, I, I only had eighteen, I think, but he gave me thirty two. I filed out because he was so quick. Mm-hmm. Well, make a long story short, he was in the Hall of Fame now. Played many years for the Houston Rockets, number one pick type guy, but he was also the world famous for being a baton twirler. Oh wow! I, I mean, he was just phenomenal athlete. He was one. Yeah. Um, and then um, Charlie Scott was another one. Charlie played for North Carolina. Charlie was the first African-American to play at North Carolina mm-hmm. and just had a phenomenal career, went to the Final Four, played against then Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, or excuse me, Lou Alcindor, who became Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Uh, they lost, but 
uh, we played char- we played North Carolina in, in the um, in the Carolina Classic in Greensboro. Um, the former commissioner came off the bench. Um, yeah, he was uh, he played for. Him. Oh, uh, um, not this la- not not the last one, but not the one that just resigned, but the one before him. Gosh, I'm gonna, I'm, anyway, yeah. he he came off the bench. Yeah, they had a real good team. Um, and Coach Smith, obviously great coach. Uh, then there was Iowa. I played against uh, the Hawks. I forget what year. It must have been seven, end of 70 or the beginning of 71. Downtown Freddie Brown was yeah. unbelievable. Um, I had 28 or 29 points. Okay, he had my 30, bad. I said 26, so he, I'm he, short you. He had 32. I had 12 rebounds. Um, so it, it was a, it was fun playing against the yeah. better the player, the you know, the at least for me, the bigger the challenge. So, yeah. and then um, Marquette was really good back in those days. Al McGuire's team. Yeah. So we had a, a home and home with them. Oh, nice, nice. And, but they were number one team in the country. Yeah. So they came number one team in the country came to Bowling Green. Well, of course it was sellout. But, yeah. You know, Dean Memminger and a lot of other names that older people would remember. Uh, but yeah, yeah, we we had some good times and. The last NCAA tournament game that Bowling Green played was against Marquette. Wow, that's awesome. I got I to gotta say this. I don't know if you remember the story. <clears throat> and I'm trying to remember if it was Minnesota or it was Ohio State, but it was my freshman year. <laughs> and you were talking about, you know, we're talking about you as a player. And right. there, was, there was one person who will remain nameless that didn't think that, because at the time you said you could still dunk. Yep. And there was a player on the team that said that, <laughs> that you couldn't do it. And so I don't know if it was a bet of meal money or something like that, but uh, I do remember you going up <laughs> and dunking it. And uh, it was kind of one of those things like everybody was like, like jaw drop, but you just walked away like, I told you, you should, you should never doubt me. <laughs> well, it, you know, and unfortunately when I was playing, um, they stopped dunking. Yeah. And so my legs were really bouncy for a lot of years after. Um, I would have been a, you know, a really uh, prolific dunker had it, uh, had we been able to, because I could just do that. And, yeah. you know, it's just one of those God given things. But um, yeah, no, I was 50 the last time I did my last dunk. Yeah, I won't be doing that. So. <laughs> <laughs> I get, I get it, and you're smart because yeah. I, I don't have a knee here, and I got a replacement over oh, here. So yeah. it, you, yeah. you you probably won't get it. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm good. Well, you know, your, your career was great. You had a great career. I know your uh, your last year, you were second team all conference, and then you end up getting you got drafted that year. So obviously, the draft back then is a lot different than it is today. What would you say? You know, the question, and and I, and I know I didn't throw this one out to you, but what would you say? is good about the draft today or something that you wish was like maybe like it was back in the 80s or 90s or something like that um yeah ohio university was very good back back in the day the middle american conference was a lot better than it is now we played many more uh, high major teams and mac or mid majors play now um and we had a we had great tradition at our school um but in answer to your question uh, I was drafted by um, I was drafted by Cleveland in the ninth round, and they had ten rounds back then. And I was drafted by Indiana. I want to say the fifth round. Indiana was an ABA team, okay. Pacers, and um, and obviously Cleveland was a new uh, NBA team. And what happened? Coach Fitch went on to Minnesota for a couple of years. And then Nick Maletti called him the owner of the Cavaliers. And mm-hmm. in, in, in finishing the story about Calvin Murphy, that was how uh, the Cleveland Cavaliers got started. Mm. When we played those two games, sold them out, yeah. the, the excitement in Cleveland was off the chain. So Nick bought a team. Oh, wow. And, um, um, you know, I was obviously the first Bowling Green guy. He went to Bowling Green. I was the first Bowling Green guy to get drafted um, by the Cavaliers. So it, there was a there was a little symbolism in that, right? Um, and um, I think it was more symbolism than it was, you know. Austin Carr was the first pick overall, yeah. so and I I think everybody knows how great his career was. So um, 
um, that part of it was really meaningful. And the, the staff, the assistant coach that was my freshman coach, uh, was the assistant general manager. Okay. And he's the one that drafted me. But also, but what happened, I ended up signing with the Indiana Pacers, uh, George McGinnis, Darnell Hillman, uh, 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 Mel Daniels, oh, they were ABA champs, mm-hmm. and I went in. Um, had a good, had a really good, good, good uh, camp. Did everything well, um, but they wanted to make some moves with Rick Mount. Uh, the numbers were stacked against me, yeah. and um, I, I didn't, I didn't have that uh, burning desire to keep to go to what was Eastern League, which would have been the equivalent of the G League, or gotcha. go overseas. I just I wanted to make it. I thought I was good enough. Um, I was a late bloomer, mm-hmm. uh, that, all that kind of stuff. I got better and better and better and better. And so I just went into coaching. Yeah, yeah. And you went back to Bowling Green yep. as a grad assistant and yep. spent some time there. And then, um, you know, fast forward, you go to Western Michigan as an assistant. So there's the Kalamazoo connection. Exactly. There. Your assistant coach there. And then your first head coaching job was at Elmhurst College. Elmhurst College, outside of Chicago. But then the big one is Florida International. Yeah, yeah. You, know, you went there and you, I mean, you basically were the program. Yeah, um, I started the program in 1981. Um, it was an airport, Tamiami Trail. Um, the school had 16,000 students. Chuck Perry, the former president of Golden Bear, was the first president. Um, and he was also vice president at Bowling Green when I was a student. Mm-hmm. So... It, it made a lot of sense. Nancy Olson was the athletic director, and she went to Bowling Green, and um, we were we were just friends. We were friends. Yeah. Her, she's a year older, and we were just friends because she worked in the cafeteria. But she was just a very good athlete, mm-hmm. but also just a, a good person. So I knew her from that. And while I was at Elmhurst, and I will say this about Elmhurst: Elmhurst was Division Three, but what. Getting your first head coaching job, as you know from coaching, getting your first head coaching job, you learn what you don't know. Right. <laughs> right. That's primarily right. what happens. And you learn how to become a leader of men, a leader of other coaches, and just a leader of a program. And not only did I have to do that, I had to go talk to Mr. Perry about building us a gym. I had to set up fundraising events, which which we did. I had to schedule um, Division One schools a- a- away from home right. and and to come to Miami, yeah. which you know is not a bad place to go. Right. So, <laughs> right. but I had it, it was a really tough going at that time, eighty one to eighty four, and then we got our gym built. It took us that long of a period to get uh, Division One status, and then eighty five we we went into Division One protocol and. We earned our Division One status eighty six. By that time, the gym was born, uh, mm-hmm. built. Mister Perry uh, helped me with that. Um, but anyway, I built a program from nothing. Yeah. And yeah. Um, fortunately for me, they've uh, they've rehired me. And yeah. I'm, I'm a uh, I'm an ambassador for athletics. I, I think that just means I'm old, and I'm <laughs> and the people that graduated are old, and they want them to come back. So. Well, I think it means that how much they you know, they, how they feel about you too, as well, bringing you back and and having you be an ambassador for the school. I think that's says a lot about who you are and and what you've done over this lifetime. And, you know, I mean, so you build a program and then uh, you make the decision to go, to go to Iowa. So yeah, building a program is no joke. I would not recommend that for (laughs) anyone. It's really hard. It is really hard. I got burned out, uh, so to speak. Uh, Michael, our youngest second child was born in 88 and I had Joseph and we had Joseph and uh, I had him. Yeah. Uh, we had Joseph in, um, in, uh, 81. Mm-hmm. So he was about six then, six or seven. Michael came and that was even more of an eye opener. Cause that was a total unexpected, uh, mm-hmm. uh, thing in our lives. And so I had to really, uh, step back and reevaluate it. I was getting burned out. Um, I, uh, one of the athletic directors we had had gone to the state to try to go Division One too soon, and it threw the whole plan off. And mm. so I'm playing Division One schools with a Division Two budget and players, and so it was really hard. And 
So I just decided I called Eldon. Eldon was who I worked for at uh, at a Western Michigan mm-hmm. years ago. He was at Northern Iowa at the time doing really well. We had catapulted him to Ohio State. So he had 10 years at Ohio State and done very well. Mm-hmm. Um, and Eldon, uh, Eldon called Tom Davis. And there was some stuff going on at, at Iowa. And fortunately, it was whatever it was, it was good for me because right. – uh, Rudy Washington went to Drake and Bruce went off the road and it allowed me to be on the road with Gary Close. So. Yeah. No, it was, it was great. And obviously that opened the door for me coming to Iowa, but I did put this in because, <clears throat> and I was very delicate with how I asked it. <laughs> <laughs> you sound like my kids. You sound like, you sound, I know, I, I, I'm telling you it's a trick question. I guarantee it. I said, uh, you recruited several great players to yeah. the University of Iowa. Mm-hmm. I'm not asking you who your favorite was. Right, right, right. But who was the tough? And I think I know this answer, too. Who was the toughest player that you recruited and brought to Iowa? Yeah. Um, the, I'd have to say Reggie because um, the Joker, and he that was his nickname, yeah. folks. Um, the Joker was no joke. I mean, this guy – was as tough as they come. People think he played hard on the game day. I mean, he led the nation in rebounding. He led the – I mean, he, he he led the nation. What else? What? Thing like double-double. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, led the, he, had a, he was a walking double-double. Yeah. And – but here was the deal. People – he played harder in practice than he did in the game. And the reality was he beat up a lot of people in <laughs> practice. So we we had to tone it down because he was hurting people in practice and we had to have him for the game. Yeah. And, I mean, he was just, oh, my goodness. Yeah. So after practice, he would he, he would be so tired that we, we would try to get some free throw shooting in. Obviously, that wasn't his, ever his strength. But, yeah. But – I'd say I'd say Reggie. Definitely. I was I was telling the story. I was telling our team the story of when you came back from Coffeeville and you and I had talked and you said, I got a guy coming here that's gonna play in the league ten years. I remember you telling me about Reggie before he even stepped on campus and I was telling John, our producer, I was like, Hey, Reggie played in the league for I think what, twelve, thirteen years. Thirteen years. Thirteen years. I go, but I remember I remember that conversation vividly with you. You came back like, yeah, we got Well, one. he here was the deal. We I went to a junior college tournament and and to his credit, uh Greg <clears throat> Greg Lansing's friend was the coach. Mm-hmm. And Greg said, Rich, you got to see this guy. I said, Well, I'm going to see so and so from Flint. And mm-hmm. you know, back then the Flintstones were, you know, big name and I, I'm going to go see some kid from Flint. Yeah. He ate that kid (laughs) from Flint alive. Yeah. And the thing that happened that just was so mind-boggling and blowing, he grabbed every rebound that was was capable of being grabbed. If it was shot, he got the rebound. Now, how he did that, I still don't know. Right. (laughs) But he, this guy was a rebounding machine. Yeah. And I, I hadn't, and I, I watched, it was like 10, 10 in the morning, and then at 6 o'clock, he was still grabbing rebounds. Yeah. And by, every time he'd go for the ball, bodies would be flying away from him. He'd be by himself and grabbing the rebound. I yeah. said, oh, my, I, I called Coach, uh, I called Steve Alford, and I said, listen, this is the best rebound I've ever seen. Yeah. Period. Yeah. And he never changed, and that's what he did in the NBA too. He was a, he was your defensive guy. He was your rebounder. And I think the best thing Reggie did, and we just connected too because his daughter plays for Georgia. Right, and they were playing at Iowa. Right, I saw that. The best thing about Reggie when he went to the NBA, you know, a lot of guys want to get drafted, but Reggie knew, okay, I'm not a I'm not a lock for a first round pick. And his agent was smart, and they put him in a position where he with a team that needed him. And he went in there and did it. And, I mean, his career started in Seattle when they were the Supersonics. And yeah. He just – I mean, he carved out path out with who he was when you saw him at Coffeeville, which is incredible. Well, well it, he was – he was he's just the most phenomenal rebounder I've ever seen. And I've – you know, I go back a little ways. Uh, and, and even as I look at these guys now, I've still never seen anybody quite like him. Yeah. But he got every rebound. 
And, I mean, he just had a, a nose for the ball. Uh, maybe Dennis Rodman. Maybe yeah. him, the other one. But Reggie was incredible. Yeah, no, he was phenomenal. So my next one was who was the most athletic. And I think I have – I think I know who you're going to say here, too. Um, but I would like to hear who was the most athletic player you recruited. I'm talking like bounce, you know, just does things athletically like you hadn't. Well, maybe you hadn't seen for a long time, but I think I know. But I want to hear. Well, I, I and when I thought of when I when I read that question, Kenyon, I thought of you because I thought you were. Well, I thought you were very. out, And then I, and I said, well, wait a minute. What about then? I thought about Ricky Davis. I said. You know what? The thing that caught my eye about Ricky was he. the first time I saw him, he went to the basket, put the ball between his legs, grabbed it somehow and dunked it. And yeah. I was like, and they said, he's in the uh, 10th grade or 9th grade. Yeah. And I said, are you kidding me? <laughs> and I don't know where it was in uh, someplace in the Quad Cities we were. And I just happened to be there. And he just, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. He he was like uh, just a phenomenal um, freakish athlete. He yeah. could throw it off the ball, catch it. He could throw it off the ball, catch it, slap it up against both hands, and then and then do something freaky with it and dunk it. <laughs> and I was like, how did he do that? You know. And yeah. so w when the people saw him, you know, he was older, and people at Iowa saw him. He was, but he always had a a, a bounce to yeah. him that yeah. was. Just freakish, and he and Dean uh, came out the same year in high school, and Ricky led his team to the state championship, and Dean led his team to the state championship. So we were lucky enough to get commitments from both of them because, once again, I would go to uh, the Quad Cities, and mm -hmm. I'd just walk around and meet people, and I'd, I'd, I'd learn this I learned this path to high school, and then I went up to <laughs> uh, Mason City. Did the same thing. You know, both of those are, uh, well, Quad City was a lot like uh, Battle Creek. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but Mason City was smaller, so when I went there, they all knew. It. But I would go, and they'd be talking about me being there. Well, they knew I was. Yeah. And I, I mean, they knew I was there. And, and uh, But I never, you know, I didn't get to talk to Dean. He'd, he'd run track and win cross-country meet, and Ricky would uh, hit, hit home runs in baseball yeah. and, you know, you they do other things, and so I just became so they knew me who I was, and they knew you know how interested we were because there was no way we should let either one of those guys get out of Iowa. Yeah, no, that's true, and I I love the point you just made. And I didn't think about that was multi sport athletes like they were so like they were multi sport athletes, and we talked about mm. Chris and Keen because everybody's like you got to grind and we got these kids specializing at such an early age that I truly feel that once they reach say college and they get that scholarship, some of them are burned out. And, yeah. and, but that's just kind of the world we live in right now. But I truly believe in the whole multi-sport athlete. Thing. Well, Joseph was my, our oldest son, uh, Richard Joseph was a uh, football, basketball. He won state championship in football, basketball, and in track. Mm -hmm. um, he, I think he's, Got four or five me medals in track. Yeah, um, Haluska beating in uh, long jump and something else. But that was one of the best gifts that he had. I mean, he 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 played all sports, mm -hmm. and he had a wonderful high school career. Michael was Michael kind of wanted to play or follow in his brother's footsteps, but you know, being a little brother is not as easy as people you know think it to be. Yeah. So sometimes, it, and sometimes it's, you know, pretty difficult. He stopped playing football in the ninth grade. Um, and I think what happened was Reese Morgan, the, the former high school coach there at West, went on with the Iowa staff. And um, I, I later learned, Michael said, if Coach Morgan would have still been there, and he asked me, I probably would have played football. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. So Yeah. No. So last one is, who's the easiest – player you ever recruited to Iowa? The easiest? The easiest. Like, you know, didn't give you any trouble, didn't. I wouldn't say it was me because I, I try to put myself in that. But No, you were. You were. You really were. You did a couple things, but which no one will ever know. I was going to my grave. But no, he, Kenyon was real. No, you really were. Um, uh, you really were because 
The one thing, and I don't know that the Hawk fans really realize how, folks, this young man is as smart uh, a student as you will ever see. And he took it seriously. He was very serious about his academics. Um, His mom was very serious about it. I could not talk to her without her saying, is he is he getting his books? <laughs> he hasn't missed any class. I mean, and she would hammer me. And if if you had done something, she was going to take it out on me because I <laughs> promised her. So I didn't want any parts of that. Yeah. But to make a long story short, Kenyon was the number one um, student af- Gatorade student athlete in the United States that we had at Iowa. And a lot of people didn't realize we were sitting at the table with John Wooden at the McDonald's game. Yeah. They introduced Kenyon and it was just an awesome, an awesome feeling and thing for, for everybody. But Kenyon was a, a quite a student. And I, so to see you doing this, to see the boys doing as well as they're doing, it does not surprise me in the least. Well, I appreciate the whole academic nod because <laughs> at home, you know, McKenna gets on me about <laughs> academics because she's the one at the house. And I told her, hey, I was a good student. And Michelle was like, no, you weren't. I was like, I was. I really was a good student. <laughs> he really was. He really was. And I think if there was anything that <clears throat> held him back from maybe going to the NBA, I think it was because of his emphasis on his academics, because he didn't miss study table. He took care of his business in the classroom. Um, and that, I mean, that's, I'm just telling you guys the real, real truth. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. But, you know, family is important. And I'm, you know, it's a great segue because we talked about it early 50 years. So you and Janet, 50 years this year, September, right? September 29th? Yes, sir. Yeah. So where did you guys meet? And then what is the secret to 50 years? Okay, we we she we we met in Inkster in high school. Um, we were in a state championship drive, and she was a cheerleader. And I got off the bus, and this young lady jumped up, grabbed me, and kissed me. And I, you know, I'm whoa. I was in the tenth grade. She was in the tenth grade. And honest to God, that's a true story. Wow. We, uh, we played. Um, we had just beaten Ypsilanti High School. We were in the regionals. Hoping to go to the state, and um, that's how we. Uh, that's how it started. Wow, that's wild. So, so what is it? I mean, you know, we'll Michelle and I will be twenty four years this mm-hmm. year. So halfway there, and there's ups and downs. You know, marriage mm-hmm. is is not easy, and that's what I tell a lot of people. It may sometimes from the outside people see it and they think everything's great, perfect mm-hmm. family. Mm-hmm. When inside, there's there's life things right. going on, mm-hmm. but you know, and it's tough being a coach's wife. As well. So what do you think has been the thing that has kept you guys as close? Because when I see you, when you two, I mean, it's love. You guys, it's genuine. It's pure. Um, The way you guys look at each other 50 years later, it's like, that's true love. So what what, what would be your... Um, The the one thing that that, um, um, we do is we laugh a lot. The more you laugh, the more... Um, the enzymes or your chemistry. And so she makes fun of me a lot. And I think I give her a lot to make fun of, (laughs) but she and her sisters. And so um, our families make, we make fun of each other a lot. Yeah. We don't go to bed angry. Uh, We never have. Um, We might go to bed quiet, but we don't go to bed angry. Okay. Um, and then the other thing, and I'd say laugh a lot, laugh as much as you can. But the other thing is no secrets. I think one of the biggest mistakes that people do and have, and I honestly, I still don't know why. Can you keep a secret? Can you, can you not tell so-and-so? Listen, that, that creates more problems. Right. That creates more drama. That creates more of a commitment. That create you don't need no commitments. You don't need that. Mm-hmm. You don't need secrets. Mm-hmm. Explain to me the secret that you need. Yeah. Tell I, I me the it. secret that you need. I I never could understand. Well, I can't tell my wife that 
well, you shouldn't be doing it. <laughs> right. <laughs> or I, if, I don't want her to find out. And they said, well, you know, you know, Richard can't, you know, he can't keep a secret. Of course I can't because <laughs> I don't keep secrets. Yeah. yeah. Don't keep secrets, people. Yeah. It's the worst thing you can do is not tell your best friend something that she needs to know or yeah. would want to know. Here's the deal. Would you want to know? Right. Right. And it's really, to me, it's that simple. But what happens is secrets create other secrets, create other things, create. So then you, you create this whole layer of stuff that you don't even need. Why, and why are you keeping a secret in the first place? Yeah. yeah. What the hell is a secret? Oh, excuse <laughs> no, me. You're good. No, you're good. <laughs> what, 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 what is a secret? I mean, come on. So no, we we don't keep any secrets. Um, I mean, I, if I was her, I would have divorced me a long time ago. But <laughs> thank so. God she hasn't. Yeah. So I'm lucky from that standpoint. And you know, um, I, I was I, I I had horrible hours. But the other thing, I I let her be her, and she has her own way about doing everything. And we I listened to her. And um, even now, I, and I mentioned this to you guys, I drive her to work and I pick her up. I mean, and I enjoy doing that, yeah. um, you know, and I make light of it. And, you know, I, it's me driving Miss Daisy kind of like the movie, <laughs> but it's it's fine. I mean, she, all those years she did for me, this is the least I can do. She works for George and um, Laura Bush at the uh, library and museum. She she runs that whole area. She's an administrator. Yeah. And she does, I mean, she's her own person, so. No, that's that's awesome. I, that's the one thing, too, I was telling people, like, Michelle and I do laugh at each other. Even when we went through our stuff five years ago, like, we make fun of our faults, and we have fun with it, and we laugh about it. And even McKenna, she's like a referee. She's like, you two are like teenagers, the way you guys go back and forth. But it's fun, and we, like you said, you, you when you can laugh at the things like the whatever imperfections or whatever you want to call them with your best friend, like that's fun. Like you're supposed to be able to do that. And that's what friends do. Yeah. I mean, you got, you got partners at home still that you guys, man, look at your, your peanut head or, yeah, you know, yeah. so, you know, <laughs> right. you, you know, you got guys, yeah. like, you got friends at home and, and it's the same with, with a, a, a companion. I mean, that's just, she, she's got hers. I, I definitely got mine. Yeah. Um, I've been wearing these 14s for about, uh, 30 years so yeah 14s and 15s and that that's not a lot of fun when you're, <laughs> when you're around other people because yeah. they step on your feet and, they, and then they feel embarrassed and they don't realize it happens everywhere i go because I, mean, <laughs> I got big feet yeah. it's not because of them yeah. i mean it's because my feet are big <laughs> well i want to ask grandparent michelle and i mm -hmm. demetrius just had his first so we grandparents for the first time you right. have four you have four grandkids. well we got five actually five yep. five okay yep. five grandkids so yep. um how has that been? I mean, obviously you, you become an empty nester yep. and now you can fill that time with your grandkids. What's the best part about being a grandpa? Well, the best part about, about being it is when you get done, you can go home and they stay with their kids, <laughs> to be honest. Right. That's the best part. But <laughs> be, they, when you see those, the smiles and then the characteristics, um, you realize the meaning that it brings to your life. It just gives such purpose and meaning. And you see the, your children's traits in them. And then you hear your children talking to them like you talk to, mm -hmm. like you talk to the, the children when they were children. And it just, it's just a full circle kind of event. Being a grandparent is the greatest um, Cause we get to spoil them and then we send them back to their parents. Yeah. And that, to me, that's the best part. Cause I keep a bag of cookies in my pocket. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I'd always do like rapid fire questions. I got a couple that I'm gonna throw at you here. So if you could go anywhere for a getaway weekend with Janet, where would it be? That, that one's really easy. Uh, con France. Um, while we were Iowa Hawkeyes, um, Dr. Tom took us to France and, um, that was the trip I was on, I think. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. I remember that. Yes. Okay. Con France. I, it was the best, most romantic time I had with my wife. Yeah. But also the best trip. We played uh, four games, I think, while we stayed in Con. Yeah. And Con was 
unbelievable. It was expensive, yeah, but yeah. it was unbelievably nice. Uh, people were friendly. Uh, the jazz was great at at, at night, and um, that's where I I, I I take her yeah, in a heartbeat. Yeah, that's awesome. I don't I don't know if you remember, but Michael was about three years old, or I don't know how old he was, five years old, and. Zabo had Michael driving the um, driving the um, yacht that we were on in the Mediterranean, and he was sitting up with a captain's hat. And then he he got on the loudspeaker, and we're in this yacht, and they're playing music. <laughs> My, our son was driving the boat. <laughs> it was crazy. It was absolutely oh nuts. So first of all, we were. Bad parents, because we didn't know where our son was. <laughs> but secondly, he's driving the boat that we're riding on this party boat. Oh, it was it was so much fun. That does not surprise me that Zabo had him out. Doing oh that. God, Zabo was crazy. <laughs> Boy, he was crazy. He had he had Michael. He did stuff, but he was a great guy. He was. Uh, Jim was a really great guy. He was. Well, it's been great, you know. And obviously, the podcast is called the Leave the Legacy Podcast for a reason. I think the one thing that I wanted to do with the podcast was really show with the guests that came on that it doesn't matter what walk of life you're in, what you do, where you're from, like you're leaving a legacy, you're passing something on. And so question I ask all my guests is what does leaving a legacy mean to you? Well, it, 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 you try to, you try to do something in life that is meaningful. Um, there was a saying in our household, uh, my mom and dad, um, you should, you should always be, Try to be a blessing to others uh, because that blessing could come back to you. So all my life, I always tried to be a blessing to uh, whoever I came in contact with, um, period. And it just it stuck with me. Um, it, I'm working now down in South Florida. Uh, we're doing some really uh, good things to bring alumni back uh, to contribute to that not only the athletic program, but the quality of life. Mm. In 1981, there was no basketball in South Florida. Um, if you do the numbers, if somebody were to crunch the numbers, I'd say basketball between the Miami Heat, the Miami Hurricanes, uh, Florida International, FAU, the numbers and the finance has made a major impact on that part of the world. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping to leave a legacy there. Uh, but more importantly, um, I think you try to leave what you've done in your life uh, with people so that when they think of things, they think of you. Yeah. And positive things, hopefully not, not negative things. Uh, but I've, that's the way I've tried to live my life. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's obvious. Hopefully it's obvious to you that you mean so much to me. I mean, you're still, I mean, a mentor, friend. I mean— even the little things that you've helped us on our journey as a family have uh, been so meaningful and impactful. And so you definitely have left a legacy with me on that. And, and one of the things I, I always do a quote and one of the quotes, I, I brought it up because to me, this exemplifies what you did for me. And it's a quote actually from Steven Spielberg, the director, and it's the delicate balance of mentoring someone is not creating them in your own image, but giving them the opportunity to create themselves. And that's what you always did for me, even when I messed up the couple of times that we're not going to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> um, you let me do that. And it was one of those things where you never said, I told you so. And yeah. I, I love that about how yeah. you helped me. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's one of those things that you don't want to say to me. Yeah. Um, and I always wanted you to be the best version of Kenya, not the best version that I helped or I made. or Because it's not about me. It was about your life. And quite frankly, um, I think I did a pretty good job because I let you be you. I let you make mistakes. Yeah. I was there. I let you do good things. I was there. Uh, that, 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 and I don't, re I don't know if people remember this, but that we were 25 points down from at Michigan State. And Chris had just died. Yeah. And you and Chris were really tight. And something came over you. In that game, I'm not quite sure it was, but you led the charge, and I'll never, ever forget that um, uh, that experience with Chris. 
Uh, but 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 more importantly, with you, because you went to another level, and I just thought that was you being you, and that's kind of one of the examples that I can really think of where you had a large uh, growth spurt. I mean, you yeah. your maturity just really excelled. Um, and I think now people see all the things, the, just the little things that you were able to do as a teammate, but also as a Hawkeye, I think, uh, you know, the loyalty that you show, um, the Hawk fans, the Hawkeyes, I, I just think is remarkable. But that's what we, we saw in you, and that's what we wanted for you. And that's what we wanted for Iowa, so. I appreciate that. Well, hey. It's been a great show, Coach. I want to thank you for coming on. Um, for all of our fans, hey, we're excited. Uh, we're now available on the iHeart uh, platform, uh, Spreaker. You also can go to the Talk About Network page on YouTube. Uh, subscribe, give us a like, and hit the notification button so you know when a new episode drops. If you go to uh, Spotify, Apple Tunes, or wherever you get your podcast, we're available there as well. So until next time, I'm your host, Kenya Murray. Have a good one. This podcast is sponsored by Storyline Multimedia. Storyline is an Iowa City-based media company that specializes in creating high-quality video, photo, and audio productions for local businesses. Not only that, but they also produce a number of podcasts, including this one. So if you're interested in sharing the story of your business with the world, contact them today by visiting StorylineMultimedia.com. And remember, your story matters.